You know how we look back on people 100 years ago and ask what the hell were they thinking when it comes to arsenic or lobotomies? Well, 100 years into the future, they'll probably be saying the same thing about us using CPR. TV shows show CPR being performed and the majority of the time the patients have a miraculous recovery. And the public believes it. But the reality is much different and much darker. Before we begin, we post death and dying related videos every Friday. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, consider subscribing to the channel. Now let's talk the reality of CPR. What is CPR? Okay, yes, this may seem obvious, but it's a good place to start. So St. John Ambulance Australia says that, and I quote, CPR stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It combines chest compressions with rescue breaths to give a person the best chance of survival following a cardiac arrest. CPR is a life-saving technique which can sustain life until an ambulance arrives. And of course, we've all seen the info sheets that show us how to do it, and most of us have taken at least one training course in it at some point. And I've lost count of how many times I've done training in it. The discovery that chest compressions could circulate blood during a cardiac arrest was first reported in 1878 from experiments done on cats, because of course it was. It wasn't until 1959 that researchers at John Hopkins applied the method to humans. Their excitement at this simplicity was clear. Anyone, anywhere can now initiate cardiac resuscitated procedures, they wrote. All that is needed is two hands. And we did a while back about how CPR dummies were created and started the trend on absolutely everyone being taught on them. And in 1970s, the CPR classes were developed for the public and CPR became the default treatment for cardiac arrest. Flight attendants, coaches, babysitters are now often required to be certified. The allure of CPR is that death, instead of being final and permanent passage, becomes a process malleable by humans. And the start of over-medicalization of death we see today had begun. The issues with CPR. So a few chest compressions here, a few rescue breaths there, and voila, life saved. You know that old saying, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is? Yeah, well, about that. Remember this video I showed you during one of our videos on over-medicalization? If you took the doctors out of that image and put it on social media, it would be taken down for citing the platform's rules against torture and violence in content. For CPR to have any chance of working, the compressions need to reach the heart, but we have those pesky bones in the way. Consequently, broken ribs or fractured sternum are commonplace, and practically a given if the patient was frail elderly, and they don't nip back together real quick. Another common consequence is a polymer embolism, which occurs when a clot breaks off and makes its way through the bloodstream before embedding in an artery leading to your heart or brain. That is bad, and will easily kill you if not discovered in time. But neither of those things is CPR's biggest issue. The most concerning is the neurological impact. Permanent brain damage begins within four minutes of the heart stopping. This means doctors often revive the heart, only to discover that the brain is dead. When CPR is performed in a hospital with other medical treatments such as ventilation and electric shock, 40% of patients will suffer brain damage. When CPR is performed by professionals outside the hospital, it is almost double that. And let's not get started on if a novice is doing it. But of course, that's just those who suffer brain damage, but live. Let's talk about how this life-saving treatment isn't really all that life-saving. An otherwise healthy person who goes into cardiac arrest and is administered CPR by a bystander has around 10% chance of living. The same person having that cardiac arrest in hospital and being treated by doctors has around a 25% chance of living. Much lower than the 75% survival rate the public seem to believe CPR will have. And those stats drastically decrease the less healthy the person was. So why are we all taught to do it? Like I said earlier, many of us have had CPR training, but if it's so ineffective with such horrific consequences, why are we all still told to do it? Well, while the medical community knows CPR is close to pointless, there are a few reasons. Firstly, the reality is you have four minutes to get that person breathing again. So if you see someone drop and immediately start CPR, there is a half decent chance they may survive. So all hope is not yet lost. Also, some reasons for heart stopping are more likely to respond well to CPR than others. Pulling a drowning child out of a pool and giving them CPR is somewhat more likely to be successful over a 90 year old having a heart attack, for example. 
Additionally, we're told to keep training for it because we have nothing to replace it with yet. There's no simple count along to a tune task that a member of the public with no medical training can actually do if they find themselves in this situation. And until we find something to replace it, training providers are not going to stop endorsing it. But a lot of the time, people aren't found immediately. So why do emergency services keep telling you to do CPR? Why is it drilled into us? Well, that's more of a psychological question. Say you've just walked into your grandma's house and found her unconscious. You panic, you call triple O or whatever the emergency service number is in your country. In order to get the relevant information out of you, that phone operator needs to keep you calm. And what is the most effective way of doing that? Is to give them a task to complete. Think about it. You're panicking. You call up and give your address and state that you found your grandma unresponsive. What do you do on the phone for the next 10, 20 minutes while you wait for the ambulance to arrive? Chat about the weather? No, you're going to want to do something to help the situation and feeling useless at a crisis causes panic. And this is the same reason most of us are taught CPR at work and at school, so we have something to focus on during a crisis. But there is also the dark side of being an emergency services operator. You never really know what is happening on the other end of the phone call. On most calls, they will be telling the truth. Their kid did accidentally fall into the pool. They really did just bring the shopping home to their grandma and find her unconscious. But sometimes accidents aren't always accidents. These calls and what they can record the person saying and possibly doing may be strong evidence in a legal case. And keeping someone calm and giving them a task helps keep them in that location. And should they leave or refuse, that may be a sign that something isn't right. Although that last part is a catch-22 because if you're calling up to report that your grandma has no pulse and is cold to the touch and very obviously dead, and the operator tells you to do CPR, well, there is a reason that we have so many headlines about the conflict there. And the argument of that is that the layperson often doesn't know the signs of death. Also, operators can get in huge legal trouble for lack of duty of care if they don't insist on it. Death has been hidden from us for generations, so we don't accept it when it happens, or in this case, happening right in front of us. It doesn't help that people nowadays are worried about getting sued for almost anything when it has to do with interacting with another person. And certain members of the legal profession don't really care for common sense. In saying that, don't be that pathetic person filming someone giving someone else CPR on the street and laughing at how futile it is, because you know damn well someone on social media would have done that nowadays. If there is an emergency and it's safe to do so, help in any way you can. That should go without saying. This video is for those arguing with paramedics that they should have kept doing CPR after 30 minutes, or for those riddled with guilt when they've tried to do CPR on someone and the person didn't survive. CPR is not a magical life-saving action. Whether done by a bystander in public without equipment or done in a hospital by doctors with equipment, the reality is rarely effective and usually comes with horrific medical complications. Nearly 85% of those who receive it in hospital die, their last moments marked by pain and chaos. So when would you want CPR? When wouldn't you want CPR? And have you told your family this? As usual, if you want help working out what you should and should not write in your advanced care directive and how to tell your family, head to our website and book a consultation with us and we can talk you through it. And with that, go talk death.